Okay, well, we're going to play a little game with it while we're kind of getting warmed up here, getting um, some, some awareness of attachment style. So I'm going to show just a few little clips of movies here. And what I want you to do is guess that attachment style. So we're going to watch a few here and see, see if, you can, if you can pick up some anxious attachment, some avoidant attachment. And I want you to kind of look both on the parent side and on the kid's side. We haven't really talked much about the kids yet. We're still focusing on the parent again tonight. But as you're watching this, see if you notice if, if they're the same or if they're a little different depending on what's, what's going on for these folks. So we'll start with this one here. Now, any rushing fluids? No. Are you woozy? No. How many stripes do I have? Any time. Answer the stripe question. Three. No! See, something's wrong with you. I have one, two, three. That's all I have? Oh, you're okay. How's the lucky fin? Lucky. Let's see. <laughs> Are you sure you want to go to school this year? Because there's no problem if you don't. You can wait five or six years. Come on, Dad. It's time for school. Uh-uh-uh. Oh. Forgot to brush. Oh. Do you want this anemone to sting you? Yes. Brush. <sighs> okay, I'm done. Up, oh, you missed a spot. Where? There. <laughs> <laughs> right there. All right. <laughs> What'd you notice? What attachment styles did you see there? That's actually a scene from your life. A scene from your life. <laughs> yes. Yes. We've been peering into your homes. Yes. Fearful. An anxious. I hear anxious. I hear fearful. Sure. What, what do you notice that's anxious? How can you tell? Is anything broken? It's kind of hovering, kind of high strung. Yeah, yeah. So you see that, that um, he's, he's doing a lot of attention uh, to, to the, the kiddo. Yeah. Uh, if someone said fearful. What, what, do you, what makes you think maybe fearful? Uh, you're just fearful for everything your son is doing. Just sure. Like, oh, be careful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And for those great connoisseurs of film, Finding Nemo, you know that there's, there's trauma in the story. I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but there's, um, yeah, there, there's a dad who's experienced trauma. Now a single dad raising a, 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 a kid, a fish. <laughs> and uh, and he's, he's got some good reasons for being fearful sometimes. And uh, probably got some good reasons for being anxious. So very, very good. What about, the, what about the kiddo? What do you notice? What does his attachment style look like? He seems secure. He seems pretty secure, doesn't he? Yeah, even while dad's buzzing around and, and being pretty anxious, somewhat fearful, the kid's still okay. That good news for anybody? Yeah, it's true in the movies. Oh, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, kids. He wants a little space, doesn't he? Which can happen when you have fearful, or sorry, anxious and avoidant together, sometimes you get this dance where, where dad's hovering and clinging and kids like, hey, give me some space. This is what we talked about last week when sometimes you have to kind of step over your, your own attachment style. Did anyone see him do that? Or I guess he swam over his attachment style. And what did you notice at the end? What happened? Chilled out. He did. And, and things got kind of light and got kind of playful. Good example of sometimes that happens. We can recognize we're in that space where we're getting a little bit too clingy, a little bit too anxious. And um, if we get ourselves regulated, which is a word if you don't know, by the end of tonight, you will know it well. We'll get a full brain regulation going on. And uh, we can get to a place where we're actually doing pretty well. Very good. All right. Everyone got their hankies out? Go to the next one here. Wait, stop! Riley! Oh, oh, oh we were worried sick. Where have you been? It's so late. Uh. me to 
too, but I miss home. I miss Minnesota. Spring Lake, where you learn to skate. Come here. Portrait of a certain attachment style there, right? What, what do we see? Oh, no, I'm confused. Oh. Yeah. Well, it, we've missed a lot of the story here, but the child's run off. She's pretty upset, and she's decided to come back home. And we see this kind of reconnection thing happen. And if you got a little tear in your eye like I do, you notice some, some real emotions, some real feelings happening there. What, what kind of attachment do we, do we see in that? What do you think? Secure. Secure? Yeah, how could you tell? Everyone was paying <coughs> attention to each other's emotions. They were. And it wasn't like peace about the other who was the door. Sure. They, they were present even though their kid was pretty upset. There were some tears and they were able to kind of hold the feeling. They didn't, they didn't tell her, just dry your eyes, get over it. And they weren't like they weren't overly, they weren't yelling at her, you know? They, they might have felt like it. <laughs> Yeah, she she had run away, so so there was probably some legitimate fear, <laughs> some le legitimate anxiety. So yeah, she may have been kind of avoidant, saying I'm done with you. Um, however, what what brought her back home? Did you catch that? She yeah. Letting herself feel, and and she had some memories to go back to to catch those feelings, right? So she's got this whole history of moments of secure attachment with her parents. And in those moments when life got hard and she felt like just scrapping it and, and being done with it, she went back to those moments of security and said, that's where I want to go. That's what I want to do. And really, that's what this is all about, is kind of creating those moments of attachment with our kids, creating those times, those memories, so that they've got those, those back in, in their memory banks to be able to, to draw from when things get tough, because they will. And we want to have those moments of attachment to, to, uh, to pull back to. All right, well done. Okay, we will move on into our material for tonight. Okay, week two, we are covering the brain, the nervous system, and how to stop. Uh, so we've, last week we, we kind of covered adult attachment styles and our main philosophy. We're still covering, we're still just on the adult side of this, understanding yourself to become a better parent. So last week, looking at, at our own history, looking at our past, getting to understand how we do relationship and how that can impact our relationship with our kids, whether we know it or not. And if we do know it, if we have more awareness of our tendencies, even if we're not perfect at them, even if we tend to hover too much or get avoidant too much, um, if we're aware of that, we're gonna do better, we're gonna do better by our kids. So, so tonight we're gonna move away from that and move into getting to know what's going on in your own brain and in your own body. To, to parent better. When you understand the stuff that goes on in your brain, the things that, and how your body responds to stress, um, you're more likely to parent from a place of calm, in a place of regulation, in a place of, of where you've got your best possible mental faculties about you so that you can give your kids the best of what they need. So some things to consider as we're, we're heading into this is, one, um, have you ever wondered why it's hard to think clearly when you're feeling angry? Or sad? Have you ever had a big sad moment happening in your life and it's sometimes hard to kind of get your wits about you? Or worried? If you're experiencing some anxiety, some worry, um, that it's, it's difficult to, to think straight. And also, have you ever noticed your body doing strange things when you're feeling stressed? And when you're feeling that, that sense of stress, of urgency, of anxiety, or of, of anger, frustration, whatever it is in that moment, especially when you're interacting with your kids, 
Do you ever notice some things happening in your body? And tonight, um, we will we'll get some answers to all of those questions. You will know um, very, very well what's going on uh, in, in your body, in your brain, and in your nervous system by the end of tonight. And as we're kind of segueing from attachment into the world of the brain and the nervous system, I'm going to show you another little video here about, uh, this is from the folks at Circle of Security, that's looking at how our feelings and our emotions tend to pop up as we're interacting with our kids and how to be really aware of that. So take a look at this. Parents. Throughout history, we've struggled to get it right. We hope we won't pass on our emotional issues to our kids, and we swear we won't make the same mistakes our parents did. We all have great intentions, but something seems to get in the way. Let's look at what that might be. At Circle of Security Parenting, we believe that being emotionally available to our children and their needs is the key to doing our best as parents. We call emotional availability being with. It means teaching emotional intelligence by being with our children in all their feelings, like sadness, joy, anger, curiosity, pain, frustration, excitement, and so on. Being with children helps them understand, trust, and move on from feelings. And knowing someone is with them in their feelings helps children feel less overwhelmed and more secure. Decades of research backs this up. For parents, some of this comes easily, but other times our children express emotions that make us uncomfortable. So we pull away or try to overrule their feelings, which leaves them on their own. We do this because our children's feelings can trigger strong emotions in us. We think of it like this. Our history during childhood of how core people responded to our different emotions creates the background music for how we experience our children's feelings. Let's look at this example. This girl and her father have been enjoying time together in the park, but suddenly aware of the time, dad says, we need to go. When the girl hears this, she starts crying and gets increasingly angry. All at once, the dad's background music changes. The background music that is playing for the father right now, we call shark music. As it turns out, the dad's own mother was uncomfortable with loud displays of emotion, and she didn't know how to handle them. So throughout his childhood, she repeatedly told her son it was pathetic to cry, and she never ever asked him about his feelings of sadness or anger. His ability to deal with his daughter's emotion now is greatly affected by the experience with his mother then. Sharp music, we're rarely aware it's playing, but it's our past experiences telling us to be afraid of or uncomfortable with a feeling or need that is actually safe. When our sharp music limits our ability to respond to these feelings, our children learn to hide or feel ashamed of them. This is a problem because we're teaching our children to fear emotions that are actually both safe and essential in life. Most of us experience sharp music with one emotion or another, and it's different for everyone. But whenever it is triggered, our ability to respond to our children's needs is limited. The good news is, by simply calling it by name and reflecting on what our children need in the moment, we can turn down our sharp music. This is so important because if we can learn to manage our history of negative experiences and perceptions, we can respond to the truth of our child's current situation and be with them in it. Ultimately, this will help our children grow up with a better ability to understand and share more of the emotions they experience. There's no escaping it. Strong feelings are a challenge to manage as parents, but our children always benefit when we have an accurate response to what's happening rather than reacting to the sharp music we're bringing into the relationship. Remember, there's no such thing as perfect parenting, and blame never helped anyone feel more secure. That includes blaming ourselves. But the more often we can identify our sharp music, the better off our children will be. Good deal. 
Pretty interesting, huh? I, I love that metaphor of the shark music, like jaws coming through the water, right? And, and it's, it's such a great tool to use. And I really want to encourage you for, for your homework this week to start noticing your shark music. Start noticing those things and even just being able to call it a name. Call it something and recognize, oh, I'm going to that place where I'm a little ticked off. Or I'm a little frustrated. I'm, I've kind of had it with this. And kind of checking with yourself and recognizing, oh, this is that, this is that stuff, that shark music. And I love how the video talks about how it's, it's not the blame game. We don't have to blame ourselves. All of that shark music comes from somewhere. Remember all last week we talked about our roots and our branches, our history, our attachment styles. The way we grew up most likely affects the things that bug us right now. Speaking of bugging us right now, I want you to take just a minute here and do this little exercise for me. So there on, on page um, activity five, page eight, make a list of a few things that trigger you emotionally when interacting with your children. Or, or people in general, but if you can keep it to, to your kids, that would be great. So just take, take a couple of minutes here. This is going to start giving you a little bit of insight into your, your shark music. So the things, the things that are frustrating, the things that trigger strong emotions in you when interacting with your kids. So take just a minute and take a look at that. All right. Anybody want to share? Anyone want to share triggers? Shark music, things that kind of trigger emotions for you with, with your kids. Anyone have one? Yes. Um, when they're not listening. When they're not listening. Anyone else been there? Uh, Today? <laughs> yes. Great. What else? Arguing. arguing. Yeah. How about that arguing? Any, anyone else? Yes. Defiance. Defiance. Mm -hmm. That's usually in the top five. Yes. Lying. Lying. Anyone else for lying? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what else? Whining. Whining. Mm -hmm. Screaming while crying. Screaming while. So we got a combo, the double, the double one, two, right? Screaming and crying. Yes. Out of control. Yes. Yes. So, so just as an experiment, everyone who's ever had an out of control kid, just kind of let your memory drift back to that for a moment and notice what happens. <laughs> do, you, do you feel any emotion as you even just recall that feeling? Feel any, any sensation <laughs> as you recognize that, that, remember that feeling? Everyone feel, feel warm? Yes. Anyone else? Fast heartbeat? Fast heartbeat? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Good. That means your bodies are working. Fantastic. <laughs> that is exactly what they should be doing. Because um, so I kind of triggered, I kind of tricked your memory here to, to, to trigger part of your, your, uh, your body to do something, which is respond to stress. Um, before you even have a feeling, though, before the emotion happens, before it's even a thought, it starts right, right here. Does anyone know what this thing is? That is a neuron. Fantastic. Um, we have so many of these, uh, tons of them in our, in our brain. We have them all throughout our body. We have clusters of them in our heart and in our gut. And they're, they're constantly connecting. And they're constantly receiving information and processing them to our body. Right now, your neurons are firing. They're, you're taking in all kinds of sensory information through sight, through sound, through smell, taste, touch, all of that is being, is triggering neurons in your body. And it's not just one of these though. They, they start chaining together from the moment that you're born because our bodies are awesome and they're really, really good at taking shortcuts. And they like to, to do things really, really fast. So the more of these that chain together, the quicker we can get information from one place to the next to the next. So that when you're driving and you see a red octagon, you don't even have to really process it, right? I mean, it's just kind of automatic. Your body knows red octagon means you're supposed to push on the pedal that's not the gas, right? <laughs> to get you to do something that needs to happen. That's because a chain of neurons throughout the span of your life 
is really, really strong when it sees red octagons, when it sees that stop sign. So um, what uh, fires together, so when neurons fire together, they wire together. So when one response happens, it will cause neurons to wire together. And what wires together survives together. So you get these chains of neurons doing things in your brain really, really fast. Um, so this is why a lot of times emotions and emotional thought gets triggered and kicked up really, really quickly because we have these, these chains of neurons from the time we were born firing together. Now there's a super interesting one. The longest cranial nerve in the body is called the vagus nerve, the vagal nerve. The vagus nerve starts like up in the roof of your mouth and heads up into your, your head area, then connects down into your chest area, like your heart and your lungs, and then down into kind of your intestines and your guts and all the way to your rear end. So your whole, from your, your opening here to opening here is all connected through this vagal nerve, one long nerve. Isn't that interesting? And it's processing information from the environment all the time. And this is why um, sometimes when we're in states of arousal, states of stress or heightened emotion, um, we will sometimes feel that at various places along that vagal nerve. Anyone ever had a gut feeling? That's real. That vagal nerve is connected there and there's actually a cluster of nerves in your stomach that I've heard is, is actually as sophisticated as a dog's brain. So there's enough neurons there to do an awful lot. And then anyone ever felt kind of a chest feeling when they're feeling stressed? Or feel that tension up, up here? That's because it's, it's all connected. And it's all trying to tell you something. It's all trying to tell you something in your environment is, is out of whack here. Something is needing some attention. You need to pay attention to something. When that state of arousal happens, and it's big enough, it's actually going to trigger certain parts of your nervous system. So there's, there's a, this is called, they call it like the hot cycle, um, which means it's really, really fast in response to stress. This is your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is the be on guard. I, I call this like, it's kind of like a race car. It's like right up against the, uh, the starting line and it's kind of revving its engine. As soon as it gets the green light, it's, it's gone. It is moving so, so fast. When you are stressed to the point that your body needs to react, that sympathetic nervous system fires into action and some things are going to start happening in your body. That hotness, that heat that you talked about, that's your sympathetic nervous system. The, the rapid heartbeat that someone mentioned, that's triggered by your sympathetic nervous system. That's your heart actually pumping blood to the parts of your body that need to be involved in fight or flight, meaning the large muscle groups, legs, arms, anything you would need to use to fight your way out of a situation or flee a situation is going, this, this is your body working. It's doing what it's supposed to do. Your pupils dilate. You get this kind of razor focus and your eyes kind of squint and, and your, um, the flow of saliva is inhibited that dry mouth. Anyone ever done public speaking? And when you get up in front of a lot of people, you notice that dry, that dry mouth that happens? That's your sympathetic nervous system saying, there are way too many people looking at you right now. This is not normal. And so it kind of sends it like a stress signal to your body, right? And your, um, so it's, it's getting you ready for action. It's getting you hyped up, amped up, ready to fight or flee, which in a life and death situation is absolutely necessary. It's critical. It's got to happen. This is the, you don't have time to think about it. You just have to respond. Like, you know, if you're hiking up Spencer's Butte and you see a patch of like yellow fur and some sharp teeth and it looks pretty big coming at you and you think, oh my gosh, there's a, there's a mountain lion coming after me your sympathetic nervous system is gonna fire like that and you're gonna get that burst of blood and you're gonna get the, uh, you're gonna be ready to, to, to do fight or flight, which is good um, when it's actually a life and death situation. 
However, sometimes our bodies and our emotions get a little mixed up. And sometimes we go into fight or flight when we're with our little ones, right? When we're with our kids and our sympathetic nervous system is firing, they're going to see a grown-up who's getting big and who's getting strong. Hands clenched is part of the sympathetic nervous system. Your body's tightening up and tensing up. And what does that look like to our kids? It looks like danger, right? We're getting big and we're getting strong and we're breathing erratically and our hearts are, are beating erratically. We're, we're in a space where it can be perceived as a real threat to our kids. Now, the parasympathetic nervous system is the other side of that. This is, if, if the sympathetic is a race car, the parasympathetic is like the parachute poof, that pops out the back to slow it down, right? So the parasympathetic slows everything down. It reverses all of those things. You get the saliva back in your mouth so you can actually talk and communicate again. And your heart starts to slow down. And you get the blood flowing a little bit more freely. And, and, and your hands kind of come apart. And you're, you're in this, this good kind of calm space. This is when your body has given you the all is clear. Right? So if I was hiking Spencer's Butte, see a patch of yellow fur and sharp teeth, and I think, oh my gosh, it's a mountain lion, and I take another couple of steps and realize it's actually just a really big golden retriever. In that case, my, we're going to have more information to the story, and that's going to trigger an all is clear. It's going to say, your life is not in danger, it's just a big goofy dog, you're going to be okay. And you start to get that, that calm peace back, back to your body again, which is super cool. Um, as this is happening, though, that's, that's the hot cycle. Really fast, really strong, electric, off and on. The slow cycle, or the cold cycle, is long and slow. This is the endocrine system. So your sympathetic nervous system is like electricity, like an email, a text message, is super fast. Your slow cycle, or the, the uh, endocrine system, is more like snail mail. Right? It's longer, it's slower, but you got something solid when you're done with it. You're getting some real chemicals flowing through your body. Now sometimes this is going to be adrenaline. If it's a fight situation, if you're fighting for your life, you're going to get a burst of adrenaline, which in life-threatening situations is awesome. It's perfect. This is like when you hear people pulling the doors off of cars to, to rescue a child inside. The super burst of, of superhuman strength that happens in really, really severe situations, um, which is, is amazing. However, your body cannot do that for long. And usually you feel this, this deflation after that, and you feel kind of, kind of wiped out uh, because your body's been depleted of a lot of energy. A another chemical that may be released if it's not a fight or flight, if it's more of like a stress situation, is a chemical called cortisol. Now, cortisol is also really good stuff when you need it. When, when you're in a stressful situation, your body recognizes that. You probably got the, your sympathetic nervous system firing. You get a burst of cortisol. It gives you that shot of, I can do this. That shot of, I can get through this moment right now. Uh, I'm going to be able to get through it. And usually you do get through it. And, and then the stress goes down and the cortisol goes away after a while. It has a, a lifespan of around eight hours in your body. There's, there's particles of it, and about, about an hour, half of it will be gone, another hour, half of that will be gone, and it will eventually deplete out of your system, but it sticks around. And when you have a burst of cortisol in your body, um, certain things happen, like you don't make new memories very well. You don't learn very well. So when you're super stressed out and you're feeling a lot of tension, it, it's hard to learn and it's hard to, to make new memories, um, which is good that it leaves your body because then you, you can kind of get back to that baseline where you're feeling pretty calm, pretty regulated, and you can go back to your, your smart self again. However, if you are under stress for long periods of time and your body is getting dumps of cortisol again and again and again um, in large doses and over large periods of time cortisol is actually toxic to the body systems and it can cause all kinds of, of health problems um, and eventually 
if it's there for long enough, the brain says enough is enough and it actually kind of turns off the faucet and, and you get no more cortisol, um, which is good for like keeping you alive because that toxicity is gone. However, the next time you're in a stressful situation and your cortisol is turned off, you don't have that burst of I can do it like you used to. So chronic stress is really bad for your body. And, and chronic stress leads to even less ability to, to manage stress. So we get this, like as adults, you know, if you've ever been there, like in, in college or graduate school, or just a, a tough work situation, or a tough relationship situation, where you've been under stress for a long period of time, and you feel that just kind of ick, and that kind of like you're not thinking really clearly, and it's kind of hanging around, that could be part of what's going on, just, just biochemically. We think about this from a kid's perspective, though, and we'll, we'll get to th this in a few weeks, but think about a kid having a blow-up right before school starts, and that cortisol is flooding their body, and it doesn't just leave because, you know, we've, we've said, I'm sorry, and we, we send them off to school. Sometimes those, those, those chemicals kind of stick around, and they can hang around, and it can kind of you know, blow a, a kid's day, or if they have a fight first period in school, or they get really into it with a teacher, it can make sense why the rest of the day feels kind of rotten after that too. So those are some things that are happening for us. There's the hot cycle, there's the cold cycle, um, there's the electricity part, and there's the biochemical part. All of those things are going on. So there's an activity there. You don't necessarily have to do this right now, but at some point I would encourage you to do this. Think about how do you recognize when you feel calm? What does that look like to you? Do you recognize you feel peace? Do you recognize kind of a, a sense of well-being in your body? Do you recognize kind of clear thinking? And what are some ways that you personally perceive stress? How do you feel it? How do you recognize when you're under stress just from a body standpoint? Do you recognize like a tension in your neck or a ringing in your ears? Do you recognize that, that kind of heart racing thing that happens? Can you recognize uh, the, the clenched fist that, that happens? So the first step is really recognizing it. You know, understanding, wow, thank you body. You're working great. This is what you do. Uh, you're responding to stress just like you're supposed to. However, when we're in relational settings, um, we want to be able to maybe do some things about that. So before this even becomes like a conscious thought, before we're even aware of why we're upset or frustrated, we can go ahead and start taking some steps to, to get that sympathetic nervous system on board, to get that calm and that peace and that well-being back that we need because our kids need us to be able to be calm regulated and peaceful when they're interacting with us. So there's a couple of things, or actually four things that I'm going to suggest right off the bat, some things to do to, to kind of start to trigger some physical calming. Um, one is the magic mustache, which is super fun. Your kids will love this too if they're of a certain age, but it, it's just putting some pressure right here above your lip and counting to 10 for about 10 seconds. That's, that's a pressure point that kind of uh, lets your body know that things are going to kind of be okay. So this magic mustache thing, this is great. You can tell your kids to make their magic mustache and they can, they can push right here. This is also something you can do, like if you're in a, a stressful like job interview or, or business meeting or something, it's kind of one of those, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, right? Hmm, put some pressure here and it kind of helps me kind of get calm and regulated again. Another pressure point that's, that's nice is right at the base of like where your, your uh, spine meets your skull. I call it like the brainstem massage, right? It's right, right where your brainstem is, and it's kind of uh, triggering to your brainstem that, hey, things, things are going to be okay. Things are feeling, feeling all right. So just a couple of physical things you can do. Another one, I call this switching from autopilot to manual control. You know, like in the, in the airplane cockpit, they've got like the autopilot when everything's just doing what it's supposed to do and it's all firing. Uh, until you're like realizing, you know, like in the action movies when you're actually heading towards, you know, the side of a mountain. And all of a sudden you have to flip it off of autopilot and turn it back on to manual control. So this is a way to, to take control of your sympathetic nervous system. Uh, the first one, remember I mentioned clench fist? is part of your sympathetic nervous system firing, right? So if you recognize, 
my, I'm, I'm feeling really ticked off right now and I'm recognizing a tightness in my hands, even just recognizing it, feel the tension, and, and just kind of spread those hands apart. That spreading of your hands is, is sending a message to trigger the parasympathetic nervous system to actually fire, which is kind of cool. It's saying, hey, hands, you noticed that there was, there was a threat, but brain is saying, hey, we're going to be okay. So I'm going to take manual control of my hands and, and reverse the process of the sympathetic nervous system. The other one is actually doing some deep breathing. So you've probably a lot of you have done this. Told your kids, hey, just take a deep breath, <laughs> right? Which sounds really great and like, hey, I'm taking a deep breath and all is good. And, but it's actually something physiological. You know, none of you have probably been thinking much about breathing tonight, have you? That's because your brainstem is really good at keeping that going without you having to think about it. It's great because you can think about other stuff and not about breathing. But if I tell you to, to focus on your breathing, everybody take a big deep breath in your nose, out through your mouth, and take one more. Now you're thinking about your breathing, aren't you? You know, I, you, you listened, you processed, and you did what I asked you to do. You can do that with yourself. Ask yourself to take some deep breaths. Go to your breathing. Listen to your breathing. Listen to how it sounds. Listen to how it feels. And taking those big, deep breaths is the opposite of the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic says short, fast, in, out, really quick. Let's just get lots really fast. Um, taking deep breaths is actually triggering the, the parasympathetic nervous system to give the all is clear. Gives you lots of good oxygen to the brain so you can think, think more clearly. All right, now we're going to explore the brain. So we haven't even, we're, we're like below the neck right now. We're in our, our neurons, we're in our nervous system, and we're in, in the, those sorts of things. We're going to move up and, and look at the brain anatomy. and What's happening on a brain level when we start to feel emotions, when we start to feel stressed, when all of those things that you just mentioned, the whining, the crying, the defiance, the kicking, the screaming, the disrespect, the lying, whatever it is, uh, we're, we're going to kind of recognize how that travels through the body. It's going to start in your ears, you're going to hear it, in your eyes, you're going to see it, and then your brain is actually going to start processing it. So we're going to look and see what, what this amazing machine actually does and what are the parts of it. So I want you to think about the brain in terms of upstairs brain and downstairs brain. Those are the, the two most important parts that we'll talk about tonight. But we'll also kind of dig down into the basement. The basement's going to be your, um, your, your basics and your survival stuff. But the upstairs brain, this part is crazy important. This is like what makes us human. What makes us capable of doing things like stand-up comedy and creating the internet. This is the creative, the problem-solving, the language ability, the rational, logical parts of our brain. Um, this is crucial for higher level thoughts, reasoning, problem-solving, decision-making, and even like awareness, consciousness, your, your ability to be conscious and present has some, some domain up there in your upstairs brain. This part of your brain is super important for things like communicating with your kids, thinking logically, thinking rationally, problem solving with, with your kiddos. It's got its job. It's the thinking brain. Down below that is the, the limbic region of the brain. This is the downstairs part of the brain. This is where emotion, motivation, reaction, even fight, flight, and freeze live in that part of the brain. This, this kind of helps us with how we shape our focus and the things that we pay attention to. This is kind of that survival part of our brain. This is the feeling brain. Upstairs, thinking. Downstairs, feeling. Um, it's got its job also. Its job is to kick you into action before you have to think about stuff. This is, its job is going to be connected with your body and your sympathetic nervous system. Its job is to, to get you aware so that you stay alive. 
And then our, down, our, our lowest part, our basement brain, is actually what keeps you alive. So things like um, wake and sleep, breathing, heartbeat, that's all brainstem kind of activity. So that's, that's, those are kind of the main parts of your brain. Upstairs thinking, downstairs feeling, basement keeps you alive. Within our upstairs brain, though, there's actually two halves of it. You've got your right hemisphere and your left hemisphere of your brain. Has anyone ever heard of this, being right-brained or left-brained? Um, it's kind of a myth. I mean, we're all both-brained. We all have a right and a left hemisphere. And it's connected by this, this uh, tissue in the middle called the corpus callosum. It's like a superhighway connecting your right and your left hemisphere of your brain. Your right and your left hemispheres are also really important for different reasons. So our, our left hemisphere is where our literal, logic, linguistic, linear thinking, letter of the law, all those L words all live in the left brain. And the left brain loves that because it, it's order and it makes sense. And you can remember it really easily. So that logical, literal language, that's that part of our brain. Our right hemisphere is kind of more around images, it's the big picture kind of more of our emotional, kind of the poetic, creative, uh, and it's more like the spirit of the law, right? Where if left is the letter of the law, right is more about interpretation and like the spirit of the law, right? And you can see how both of these are really, really important, right? When, when, and, we, and we tend to lean sometimes one direction or the other. I mean, all of us have both, but, but you know, all of you in here, probably some of you relate a little bit more to the left hemisphere. And some of you relate a little bit more to the right hemisphere, which is fabulous because that makes us all just a little bit different and makes the world wonderful. And, and you have different people for different things. Like when I'm getting my taxes done, do I want to go to a right or left brain person? I'm going to go to the left brain person. I don't want them getting creative and poetic with my taxes, right? <laughs> but if I want to go see something in, in an art museum or get inspired by some, some music or some poetry, um, I'm, I'm probably going to go to my right brain folks to see what they have to create and make me beautiful. Um, ideally, when all these parts are working together, it's optimal. Things are best our upstairs, our downstairs, our right and our left. When we're working together, those are good things because they, they matter. The facts matter. The literal part of the argument matters. And the feelings matter. Our upstairs, our thinking clearly really matters. But our, our response and our emotions actually really matter too. In best case scenario, when we have our, our downstairs brain saying, hey, here's a big feeling, and our upstairs brain saying, yeah, I know, and this is what that means, and this is what we need to do about it, that's when you can see it's working at its best. And we have a right brain feeling that's informed by a good plan from the left brain. You see how that synchrony works so well, and this machine works at its best. However, it, it doesn't always work that way. When it's working together, we call that integration. Upstairs, downstairs, integrated, working together. Right brain, left brain, integrated, working together. It's the opposite of integration. Disintegration, right? A disintegrated brain. So what disintegration looks like is stress overwhelming your upstairs brain. If you're trying to think clearly, trying to think logically and rationally, you're trying to have this like conversation with your kid and then they start whining or complaining or getting really defiant with you and your stress level rises to the point that it knocks your upstairs brain offline. When that happens, what are we left with? Yeah, with our, with our feeling, with our, with our survival. So we're in a situation, we're interacting with someone that we love, our stress overwhelms our thinking clearly, our rational brain, and all we're left with is our feeling brain, which is not the best of situation. 
Let me give you another analogy to look at this. This is, this is from um, Dr. Dan Siegel's work around the brain, which most of this material tonight is. So he's got this great hand model of the brain. So it looks like a hand around, a, a fist around the thumb like this. So you've got, you've got these, two of these in, inside your head right now. This part, the, the fingers up here, are our upstairs brain, our cortex. The, uh, the part, the thumb underneath, this is our downstairs brain, our feeling brain. So what happens? Oh, we've got our basement too. <laughs> our wrist is our brain stem. Um, so under stress, stress comes, knocks out the upstairs brain, and we have what Dan Siegel calls a flipped lid, right? Our lid is gone, and all we're left with is downstairs uh, and survival, our fight and flight. Um, which again is great if you're running from a predator in the environment, <laughs> not so great when we're interacting with our kids. Because when, when our kids flip their lids, doing things kids do sometimes, because by the way, I didn't even mention this, upstairs brain is not even fully formed until like age 25, 26. Some people say even later than that. So we're dealing with brains whose upstairs is still under construction. So it makes sense why they flip their lids a little easier than most adults. So we've got a kiddo flipping their lid. Then we've got a grown-up flipping their lid. What are we left with to solve the situation? <laughs> a lot of emotion, a lot of feelings. This is a great power struggle situation right here, right? This is where our, our rational thinking goes bye-bye and all we're left with is these really, um, these big feelings that are happening. Um, so sometimes this is where like really um, irrational consequences come, right? When our kids flip their lids for the eighth time that hour <laughs> and, and then we're saying, okay, enough. You know, you're grounded for the next six years right? Because that sounds really logical to this guy down here. It sounds really like a good idea. We're just going to you know, lock down and then we're going to lock him in the basement and we're going to just you know, ground this kid forever. No more social contact ever. Um, which makes a lot of sense to an emotional brain, right? But then what happens when the lid comes back down? This guy says, you idiot. <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> Don't you know who's going to have to follow through now? <laughs> this guy, right? Um, so this is, this is a lot of times when we sometimes get a little ahead of ourselves. And if we can recognize that, if we can recognize our, our flipped lid, and we can do something about it, because we are adults, and we are the ones with the fully functioning frontal lobes, if we can do something to, to get our lids to come back down, this amazing phenomenon happens, and it's called co-regulation. What that means is kiddo's got a flipped lid, grown-up is able to pull it together, and they actually exude calm. They, they, their calm and their peace is like, almost like physically tangible to, to the flipped lid. And what happens at that point is, is that flipped lid starts to borrow some of the calm from the grown-up there. And when the grown-up is doing things like listening and using empathy and keeping calm and keeping regulated, that's the best possible way to get our kids' lids to come back down again. Because the opposite, and, and it's, it's kind of counterintuitive, we feel like if we just get bigger and louder and stronger, then we're gonna make them become calm and actually start listening to us and behave. Um, which, which is just going to send them deeper into that fight or flight. It's saying, you know what, you were right to get your lid flipped. This is really dangerous, and we just got to keep here until we ride this one out. As opposed to a parent who's regulated and is sending that signal to the other brain, which says, hey, kiddo, it's going to be okay. Look, I'm here for you. I hear, I see what's going on, and we're going to make it through this one. And you can actually start to hear what's going on. And some cool brain stuff happens where they release this brain chemical called GABA, which is actually its whole job is to, to, uh, to calm the downstairs brain. 
And you've probably felt that. Has anyone ever been around someone who really gets them? I mean, you're talking and someone really hears you, I mean, really hears you and understands you. And you start to feel that sense of well-being. There, there's some brain chemistry involved in that. Our brains are wired to be able to, to calm and to become more, more soothed when we feel heard and when we feel listened to. All right, so, so we have some upstairs, downstairs, some flipped lid disintegration that can happen. We also have disintegration that can happen when our right brain and our left brain stop talking to each other. Right? When we have a situation, um, Dan Siegel calls this the, the left brain desert. If we're just so stressed out and so fed up or frustrated with the situation um, that we are locked away in our left brain, then we cut ourselves off from feelings. And we're in this kind of dark and dry sort of place where only facts and what's literal and what's logical exists. Um, which is tough when you got a kid who's stuck in the right brain, right? If you come at them with just the facts, um, that might send them deeper into what, what Dan Siegel calls the right brain tsunami. Anyone ever been there? Anyone experienced one of those? This is where the right brain becomes really, really dominant and the left brain is cut off. We are in feeling land, feeling central. We're so wrapped up and overwhelmed by the emotion of the situation that we sometimes lose what's, what's logical. We sometimes, and we might even lose our language ability at this point. We just don't even have words to express what's going on. Um, so the, the right brain tsunami, the left brain desert. So, um, yeah. That's kind of what it looks like. Now, there's this other analogy that, that Dan Siegel started using in his newest book called The Yes Brain, which if this stuff is interesting to you, I highly, highly recommend uh, the, the Yes Brain. But he, he has what, he's, what are called the zones of regulation. So the, the green zone up here represents the lid is down. This is integration. This is when you're, you're upstairs and you're downstairs, your left and your right, they're all doing what they're made to do. They're all doing what they're supposed to do. And you can feel, but you're also logical. You can connect emotionally, but you're not overwhelmed with your emotions. You're able to communicate with people. You can, so you can access your language, but you can also access your, your feelings in the moment. So, um, so this looks like kind of parenting from our best selves. And honestly, the, the best interventions you will ever do with your kids are going to be when you're in this green zone. When you're able to connect with what's going on, you're not, you're not you know, letting stuff slide and you're not like, ignoring things. You're paying attention to what's happening. You're taking it in, but you're still calm enough to be able to, to uh, intervene in a way that's helpful. When our lids flipped, Dan Siegel has uh, these two other zones that, that's like when we've got a flipped lid um, that we, we tend to go to. And the first one is the, the red zone. So this is like the, the active part of a flipped lid. We've got a flipped lid that's going to the fight response. This is where things get really loud, get really big, and can sometimes get a little aggressive. Um, sometimes it's, it's uh, you know, an anxious attachment will trigger a red brain experience if we feel so anxious that we jump into that. Or um, this is where, where we, uh, we, we are in like a power struggle with, with our kiddos. So that's what the, the red zone looks like. It's kind of the hot, big, angry, somewhat <coughs> aggressive side. The, the blue zone it's kind of the opposite of that. Now, it's still a flipped lid, right? It's still emotional brain, but this is the I'm done with you side. This is kind of more of our avoidant attachment folks who have said, enough of you, I'm done with you. I'm, I'm tired of this happening, and I'm just not going to talk to you right now, and I might just start kind of distancing myself from you emotionally. So some shutting down. This is the, uh, the freeze as opposed to fight or flight, um, we, might, well, we might flee, we might just leave, or we might just kind of shut down all, all together. Um, so that's, that's kind of what, what those look like. So the red zone, the green zone, the blue zone, upstairs, downstairs, left and right. Any questions so far about, about any of this brain anatomy stuff? 
I know, we, I know we've talked a lot. This might feel like you're kind of in a college class tonight. So, yeah. Is this where the saying, have you heard you live, came from? It might be. I don't know. It sure fits. I don't know if one came first or one, one uh, came second. But it, it's a great analogy to go back to, the flipping the lid. This is a great symbol to use with your kids. Teach them. Show them what this looks like. This is a great symbol to use also with your partners, with your spouse, with your neighbors, with people that you love and you talk to. If you can kind of do this and recognize, okay, here we are. Um, that's, that's kind of what we see. So, um, you know, when, when I'm kind of at my best, I feel like I'm a pretty good driver. I feel like I drive really well and, and I'm usually pretty courteous. I kind of let people in when they're trying to, to merge with traffic and I feel like I'm, I'm you know, in a pretty good space. And, and in those moments, my family likes me and they're kind of okay with me driving them around. And that's when I'm in my green brain, right? Until something really crazy happens or I'm in crazy traffic in a big downtown area somewhere. Not Eugene traffic, I mean like other places where there's actually really traffic. And my GPS that I've been relying on for this whole time decides to just shut down on me. Then I'm left with my own wits, which is a very bad space for me to be when I'm driving in big city areas. And at that point, I get kind of a flipped lid. And this is when my, I start to get a little bit more animated and I might say things that I might want to take back later. And this is when my, my wife and my kids are maybe a little bit less happy to be around me. <laughs> and my, my whole experience, my expression is not showing a whole lot of calm. Um, if I were a blue zone person, I might just pull over to the side and just be done. I'm not driving anymore. I'm done. Someone else take the wheel. I'm just, I don't even want to deal with this anymore. Um, but that's not typically my, my response. Um, but after a while, and my wife is a saint, and she has learned to talk in ways that my red brain can kind of understand and kind of pull me back down to being a sane human being again. And when she's kind of got that regulation piece and can kind of say, hey, I recognize you're, you're here, aren't you? And, and talk nice and peacefully to me. That helps me kind of co-regulate back to the space where I'm in a good place and when I'm doing things that I'm proud of again. So, again, upstairs, downstairs integration, left and right integration, when it's all working together, it's, it, that's our best possible scenario. So how do we get there? What do we do to get an integrated brain? I'm going to give you two things to do right off the bat. Um, first is um, prepare before you get into a crisis. Before you find yourself in that point where you flip your lid, do some things to promote green zone living. Integrated brain living. So I'm going to recommend, so there's an activity there on page, um, activity six on page nine about supports and self-care. So I actually want you to do this. I want you to take a minute here and just kind of do, do some, some personal assessment here. Um, who are your support people? Who are the people that you go to to promote green zone living for yourself? Who are the people who listen to you, who understand you, who when you've got a stressful situation are there for you and aren't going to give you judgment or hassle, but are going to be there to help promote kind of your peace? So think about the people in your life. Um, so there's one column for that. Who are your supports? And the second part of that is actually participating in frequent and regular self-care. So what are the things you do to recharge your batteries? You can't just white knuckle it through life all the time. And the, the flood of the cortisol and the stress in your body, you gotta unwind and you gotta get to a place where you can get some peace and some relaxation. So, so what are those like life-giving activities for you? What are the things that kind of give you peace, help you feel recharged? Can you give us a Sure. Um, well, one up there is, is actually exercise, running. Um, it's, a, it's an actual like proven fact that when you participate in regular physical activity, it literally resets your cortisol levels. So that's a way to keep your body in a place where you're better able to handle stress is by exercising regularly. Yeah. Just a neurotrophic factors in your head that actually prepare memory and emotional 
Nice. Yes. Abs oh, that's awesome. So it's some, some actual brain repair happens when you're doing exercise. That is cool. Super cool. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, I think it's, it's better than nothing for sure. And if you feel supported, if you feel better after you have an interaction, I would, I would call that a support. Absolutely. Yeah. If you can have it face to face, I think that there's probably some benefits to that as well. But I think there's definitely benefits to, to people that you're connected with in one way or another, especially if you know they're on the other line and you know you can get a hold of them when you need to. Yeah. Good thoughts. Yeah. So e even like, you know, engaging in social activities, j being a part of a club or a gym or a biking group or you know, something where you're interacting with other people and kind of get both of those things, then you got kind of a double dose there. And that's, that's pretty cool. Pretty cool too. So the next thing you can do to promote integration is more, so the first one's like preparation. Prepare, keep yourself healthy, keep yourself calm, keep yourself connected with other people. And the next one is when when you've done all of that and things still go badly and you get to that place where you're feeling pretty stressed out, um, this, is, this is a model that we use to, to kind of help promote regulation in grown-ups. This is called our, our STOP model. Um, it's based on kind of cognitive behavioral therapies or cognitive behavioral strategies that look at the intersection between the things that we think, the things that we feel, and the things that we do. The things that we, can, that we do can be kind of hard to change sometimes. We get stuck in patterns, we get stuck in routines. The things that we feel can be extremely hard to change, especially in the moment. Like if I tell you, just stop being mad. How well is that gonna work, right? It's, it's tough. So sometimes we have to kind of disrupt the roots of that feeling and do something to kind of um, stir things up a little bit so that we give, get some leverage and we can actually shift our emotional state. Um, so we're going to target thoughts. We're going to target the things that we think. If we can identify some thoughts that are happening, and then if we can, we can uh, even do some behavior, some activities to kind of help us um, feel a little bit more regulated, then more than likely we're going to be able to shift that emotion at least a little bit, enough to get us to a place where we're behaving in a good way with, with our kiddos. And we're, we're doing things that we would feel proud of afterwards. And if we actually change our thinking and it changes our feeling, that might translate into better actions as well, doing things from a better place. So here's the stop model. I use lots of icons um, when, I, when I'm doing this uh, just to kind of represent the things that are going on here. So the, the red heart over here, this represents kind of our self-value. These are those things that are kind of inside of us that we all need to one extent or another at different times. These are things like feeling lovable, feeling in control, feeling respected, and feeling connected. These are all things that you weren't mentioning when I was asking about triggers. Those are things that are kind of the opposite of when you're feeling triggered. But when everything is fine, when you're asking your kids to go clean the room and they do it, you feel respected. You feel understood, you feel heard, you feel connected, and you feel a little bit in control of your world in a, in a pretty healthy way. Um, however, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes we give directions, we set expectations, and our kids do the opposite, or they don't do it at all. At that point, we have kind of a drop or a dip in those feelings uh, over there in, in the red heart. So the arrows hit the heart, and so those, those lovable feelings, we start to feel less loved. We might feel less connected, less respected, um, and less connected to what's going on. So we have a drop or a dip in our overall self-value based on just our interaction with, with our kids. And when that happens, it's very easy for us to feel offended and insulted, right? Have you ever been there? How dare you? <laughs> Speak to me with that tone of voice or not do the things I'm asking you to do. Those, those things, that, that offense 
is sometimes easy for us to, to, to feel and to experience. When that, that feeling that when we take offense to our kids' behaviors, um, that's when the emotions start to happen. A dip in our value and an emotion accompanies that, that dip. So we might feel sad, we might feel angry, worried, scared. Um, there's going to be some feeling, some emotional state that, that comes along with that dip in our value. And our brain doesn't like for there not to be reasons for this stuff to happen. So at that point, we start to point fingers and say, what's going on here? Why do I feel this way? And we have this tendency to kind of want to protect our ego, protect ourself. So usually that, that blame is, is, um, is somewhere outside. When we take the low road, so we're, we're trying to protect ourselves, we feel insulted, we feel emotions, we want to protect ourselves, and we go down this, this low road, that's when we get the flipped lid. And we're going to get to either um, the, the red zone over here, or we're going to go to the blue zone. And, and when we go to the red zone or the blue zone with, with our kids, um, sometimes that's when the poor choices start to happen. Either um, kind of the, the aggression, if we're in a red zone, or, or kind of distancing ourselves and cutting ourselves off from our kids if we're in a blue zone. So aggression, shouting, or withdrawing, stonewalling, all of these are like behaviors that over time damage our relationships with, with our kids. If, on the other hand, um, we, we take the high road, this is where we, we recognize the flipped lid, and we're able to do something about it, take some action, um, then we're going to get to a place where we can actually um, exercise some, some upstairs brain thinking. This is where we start to get curious about ourselves, and we get curious about our kids, and we start to, to express some empathy for our children. If we can say, wow, I asked them to clean the room, they didn't do it, I'm starting to feel pretty ticked off right now. What's that about? Right? Can I, can I look inside? Am I experiencing one of those, those dips in my self-value? Do I feel devalued by this interaction right now? Do I feel not heard, not listened to, not loved, not respected? And, and we, even just that action of trying to put some labels on what it is that we're feeling is starting to connect you with your upstairs brain. Uh, but it's, it's hard to do. So we, uh, the, the stop part of it, so before we can even get to our curiosity and our empathy, we have to stop in that state of heightened emotion. When you recognize the flipped lid, gotta do something to stop. So um, Carolyn that I work for at COFA kind of came up with this little acronym of STOP. Um, it's, it's kind of a, it's something to kind of walk yourself through. Now, the, the stop for her, um, she's kind of a visual person. She wants to say or see a stop sign flashing in, in her mind. Um, but for other people, if you're not uh, a person that, that works well with that, do, you got to do, do I'm sorry, something to, um, to ground yourself at that moment. So I'm, I'm dysregulated. I got to get connected with the ground. I have to, to get myself in a place where I can kind of think calmly and think rationally. Then the, the T is to take time to identify my feelings. What is it that I'm feeling? Ask yourself a question. What do I feel right now? And now that you all know a little bit more about even your attachment styles and your shark music and your history, you can even start putting some pieces together. Wow, this is that thing where I, when I feel disrespected, I start to get really hot, I start to get really, really angry. And this kind of reminds me of back when I didn't get a whole lot of respect when I was a kid growing up or when things happened that went badly. So you're, you're kind of playing this out and you're being a little detective with yourself, thinking through what's going on in, in, your, in your own emotional experience. So take time to identify your feelings. Putting a, a, a linguistic label on it is upstairs thinking. Thinking, why do I feel so frustrated, is logical thinking. Those are all connecting you to your upstairs brain. Those are all processes to get yourself back regulated and get yourself to a calm space. Once you do that, then you're, you're more likely to be able to do the O part, which is um, opt to give the benefit of the doubt. This is kind of where your empathy comes up. 
this is where you're, you're interacting with your kid and you kind of like, wow, okay, they didn't do so well. I'm going to opt to give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe, just maybe, there's something going on here besides they're trying to wreck my life or wreck my night, right? There, there may be something going on for my kid and maybe I can get a little curious. I wonder what's up. Gosh, what's, what's going on in their world right now? What is it that was so difficult about the situation, about what's going on for them in their life, their world, whatever it is, just be curious. Is there any other reason besides this was a direct assault to, to your respect? Then you're going to process this from a place of value. Uh, be curious about your own hurts and the hurts of others. So this is where you're going to go back to that, that first box over here. And you're going to recognize, you know what? Um, I am a lovable person. I am a respectable person. You know, I'm a person who connects with others. And just because I had an interaction with my kid that didn't go well does not mean I'm unlovable or not respectable or even, even not, um, not connected. That's, that's kind of who I am. So I've got I to gotta connect back to the core of who I am, that I am lovable, I am respectable, I am a connector. And when you connect with that, that core value, then you're more likely to act as a person who is lovable, connected, respectable with, with your kiddos. So doing whatever you can to, to get yourself grounded. Not, um, for, for you, what, whatever it is, if it's, if it's uh, you know, like physically moving yourself out of the situation, taking two steps over from the place of the power struggle with, with your kiddo, and getting to a place where you can kind of maybe take some deep breaths. Maybe it's visualization, going to your calm and your safe place. Um, maybe it's, it's saying a, a chant or a mantra to yourself or a prayer, something to, to kind of get yourself back connected with that core self of, of who you are. So when you recognize it, get grounded, get curious, go to that place of empathy. So here we go with little Sally. Mom goes to Sally and asks her, to, to go and do the dishes, Sally does them. Awesome, right? This is a parent giving an expectation to a kid. The kid does it. And how is mom feeling? <laughs> Love, respected, connected, in control, value, all of those sorts of things. And end of story, right? Things are going on just great until um, her brother gets home from middle school and she asks him to go upstairs and clean his room. <laughs> to which... Little Billy, um, right home from middle school, responds, no way. I got a lot of Xbox to do right now, mm -hmm. right? And at that point, what do we have? We've got our, our, the hearts, the arrows on the hearts, so we're going to feel a dip in our self-value. If we go to a red zone, if, we're an, if we feel some anger in that moment, um, with our flipped lid, we might say something to ourselves like, what a brat, nobody treats me this way. This is the thought that kind of accompanies that feeling. This is that self-protective part, right? That shield comes up and says, uh-uh, you don't do this. I'm a respectable person, nobody treats me this way, um, which is going to lead us to a red zone, possibly some, some shouting, maybe aggression, possibly some unreasonable consequences in our red zone flipped lid, right? Let's say the same thing happens, but we, um, we go to sadness, right, as a parent, uh, the emotion that comes with, you know, I asked Billy to go clean his room, and he said, no way, I'm going to go play Xbox, and we go to the sad feeling. Um, then a thought might come up like, gosh, I'm a terrible parent. What kind of a parent can't get their kid to do what they're asking? We, we have these, these very um, strong and sometimes irrational thoughts that accompany that, which may send us down to a blue zone. And this is where we may just say, I can't even be around Billy right now. I just can't handle the emotional pain of this, and so I'm just going to start distancing myself from Billy. And I might start getting a little bit closer to Sally, his sister, who's doing all the things that I'm asking her to do. So what they need is a parent who's able to get grounded in that moment. What Billy needs is a parent who's able to connect with who they are, be able to get to a place of, of calm and of peace, and when that happens, we're going to get curious. You know what? 
I feel really upset with Billy because kind of he's not acting in the ways that I've asked him to act, in the ways that I've wanted him to, to do things, in the ways we've been working on. And you know what? His room really does need to get clean. And it's okay for me to ask him to do that. We're, we're, we're logical. We're rational, right? We're able to get grounded, get curious. This is what I feel. This is what it's called. This is why I feel it. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm off to the races here. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to get and we're gonna try to go to our place of empathy with our kid. I wonder what's up with Billy. What's going on with him that, that this is such a big deal for him right now. And when that happens, we're, we're going to stay calm, stay connected, secure, and present, which is absolutely what Billy needs. If we just start shouting at him, that's going to trigger that, that response in him that's going to say, you know what, it's, it's, this is just going to end up badly, it's going to end up poorly, we're in a power struggle, not a good place. If you can come to him with that place of calm, regulated, self-respecting value, then you're going to get to that point where he's going to be able to borrow some of your calm and possibly start him down that road of, of de-escalation. So, like I said, the best, best interventions for negative behavior start with a parent who is calm and regulated. So the best ways that we can teach our kids the lessons that we're wanting to teach them and intervene when they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing or, or teach them the right things that we want them to be doing is to come at them from a place of, of green zone. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't have feelings. We can still be emotional in the green zone, but our feelings make sense and we can make sense of them. We are able to, to look at the logic of the situation, but do it in a way that, that also understands the world of, of somebody else. So, um, we'll, we'll watch that one next week. So, the, the idea is the be better awareness of brain activity means better interaction with, with others. If we're able to understand that, you know what? We all have an upstairs and downstairs brain. Sometimes we're more in upstairs, sometimes we're more downstairs. We all have a right and left hemisphere. Sometimes we're right brain and creative and we're kind of all over the place. And sometimes we're just really logical and list making and literal. Um, we all have all of those parts. The best thing is when we're, they're all working together. So, so recognizing, am I in my, my upstairs brain? Am I in my downstairs brain? And also realizing, I love this quote from Dr. Bruce Perry. This is pretty powerful. So it says, relationships are the absolute heart of humanity. And we are neurobiologically designed to be in relationships. We are neurobiologically designed to be able to read and respond to other people. And we are neurobiologically designed to reach out and seek relationships with people. Folks, this is Dr. Bruce Perry. He's kind of the world expert in trauma and the brain and how it works. And when he's looked into the world of neurobiology extensively over decades of times, this, this is his understanding, is that we are neurobiologically designed to need to connect with other people and to reach out and to seek connection. And that's, that's what all, all, all of our kids are really needing from us. It's an adult who gets that and, and is able to be, have a strong enough sense of themselves and a strong enough ability to, to calm and to regulate that we're able to, to interact and give our kids what they need. So, a few tips to think about over this next week. Some things to, to do, some things to practice. First one I already mentioned, pay attention to your shark music. Uh, learn to recognize your triggers. So recognize when you're coming from that place of security versus avoidant, anxious, or fearful, disorganized. Um, so so kind of pay attention to it. Um, also, recognize the early warning signs from your mind and body. If you recognize your sympathetic nervous system firing, pay attention to that. Try to intervene early. The earlier you intervene, the more successful you'll be able to be, as opposed to waiting for it to be a full-blown meltdown. That's a lot harder to pull it down. So checking your breathing. Is your lid flipped? Are you in a left brain desert or right brain tsunami? Um, the, third, the next one is, is connect with your peers. Um, talk with babysitters, people who care about your children. Um, take some time to re-explore ideas or, or activities that recharge your batteries. So this is actually part of your homework too. Do something nice for yourself this week. Find a recharging activity and participate in it. 
do it. Give it a try. See how you feel. See if you feel a little bit more regulated afterwards. And I'm going to check your homework next week. So make sure you've done it. <laughs> um, the next is, is do, to try, try that stop thing. You know, if you recognize that you've got a flipped lid, um, start asking yourself a question. Be curious. Think about what's going on. And, and uh, see if you can be empathetic towards yourself, towards your kiddos. All right. Um, I do have feedback sheets. I'm actually I'm going to send those out. If you if you put your um, your email, I'll, you'll get a, a feedback sheet uh, through the email this this week. If you would like to fill out a paper um, feedback sheet, they're they're up here. But I'll send you an email. Um, any final thoughts, questions before I break for this week? There's a lot of information. Um, soak it in. Look over it. Think over it. Um, if you've got one thing tonight. Um, that, that you can take with you and practice. I'd say, man, job well done. You've done great. Give it a try. See how it works. And I'd love to see you back next week. And we'll start looking at the world of our kiddos next week. So have a, have a wonderful one. Thanks.